People I love lost faith in me. I lost faith in me and I lost my faith. Uh, I lost hope. I tried AA, but it just wasn't enough. I needed something that would help me for the rest of my life. I needed a nurturing environment that would help me understand what I was running from. His House New Creation gave me that. I found purpose, meaning, ultimately a career helping others. Recovery is a process, and I'm grateful for the journey His House New Creation helped me discover. True recovery really does begin at His House. So give His House New Creation treatment program a call at Welcome back to High Wall Clean. My name's Eric McCoy. You know, we've been on a little hiatus. This is actually our second show since coming back. Uh, been working on a lot of different things. Um, I actually left the substance abuse field. I don't know if I had said that before. For a little while, took a trip to Europe with my wife for a few weeks and uh, then returned focusing on our show Hot Topics on Johnny Rock and Roll Radio, our other podcast, Walk a Mile in My Shoes. And so I have recently returned to the substance abuse field and I'm working to get back on track. And so I want to jump right into our show today and not ramble on as I can easily do. Now, for those who know me, again, I can't easily talk, but I got a message and introduced to our guest today from one of the finest singer, pianists performing today, Rick Delarada, uh, who was on our show in the past, and he's the founder of Jazz for Peace. Uh, Rick sent me a message and I was curious, obviously on the individual that he requested to have on our show. And our guest today is Mark Medding, who's the author of a new book titled The Jersey Death Squad, A Journey to Kill. Now I like books, but it was Mark's email that sort of locked me in. And he said, I'm, I've been sober for over eight years. Now, as you know, sobriety brings gifts to a person's life i'm a drummer in a couple bands and was drummer for a couple of dead cover bands right Mm -hmm. there i mean that pretty much locks it in (laughs) (laughs) yeah sober uh the dead uh wrote a book so just to uh i'm sorry to correct you but the book the book name is actually the jersey death squad a journey to kill jesse freeman so okay journey to kill jesse freeman all right Well, hey, uh, Mark, I want to thank you, man. Thanks for coming on here. Oh, thanks. Thank you for having me, Eric, and absolutely. And, of course, uh, I thank Rick Delarada for uh, introducing us. When he told me about your show, I'm like, oh, I said, yes, yeah, sounds like right up my alley here. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm very excited, too. I, I, You know, just two weeks ago, um, I was out in Las Vegas for a trade show, and, you know, I had to go see. I, I had to see this fear, and it just so happened that the dead were out there. So I got to see the Grateful Dead uh, or the Dead and Company, Dead and Company at um, at the Sphere, which was absolutely. If you haven't gone um, to see them in particular in that environment, uh, I highly recommend it. Bucket list it. Whatever you got to do, just go. And and one little thing I want to tell you. I mean, unless you want to be down on the floor and with the band. If you're more interested in, in the visuals of what you're going to experience at the sphere, higher is better. Mm. The 300 section and 400 section is absolutely amazing because you see, you see the whole sphere very easily. It's all right there in your face. Mm. When you're down low, you got to kind of look up. So anyway, just a little, little, uh, little point of information there for you. Here's a little piece from Dead & Company at the sphere in June. If you're only listening to the audio, you're going to miss the video. So I encourage you to check out the video of this and you'll be able to see a little bit of what they see at the show. (laughs) 
I saw them. Um, I saw Den Company at Dodger Stadium uh, years ago. I don't remember, but I want to say the audio was horrible. Oh, really? I I mean it. You know, I mean I know the dead backwards and forward. I know almost every song, but there were songs that they were playing that I literally could not even recognize what song it was. It was horrible. Jerry would have been very disappointed. <laughs> Yeah, well, I might have had something to do with the stadium sound, or maybe I don't know. I, I mean, I saw them at, um, I saw them at City Field a couple of years ago, and um, you know, I heard them, heard them fine. But you know, they're they're certainly playing a lot slower these days. And um, <laughs> but John Mayer, John Mayer can shred, man. Yeah. He certainly, he looks like he's having a great time up there. Yeah. It's so cool to see. Uh, I got to see um, uh, the reunion show in 2015. Oh, that must have been cool. Uh, yeah, I got tickets. Uh, we went up to Santa Clara. Didn't didn't go to Chicago, but got got to see him at Santa Clara here in California, and that was amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, there was no uh, Billy wasn't with him. I think he's done. Um, Mickey was there and Bob Weir, and then the rest. I mean, but you know, the rest of the band is just so so amazing i mean you got oteal burbridge just you know doing his thing which is absolutely incredible um watching him he, he's he's just loving life too it's great i mean it, it was a really you know it's it's hard to have bad sound in the sphere in particular because it's a it's like a it's an immersive experience not only uh, visually but but i mean when there are certain points in the in the songs where um like the hi-hat was very accentuated and it sounded like it was coming from behind me from the side of me it was just the coolest sound man i mean yeah. it's like it really is like this the whole sound of the of the show is like truly immersive it's all around you so you really don't have a bad seat now you said you said bill christmas then well he didn't play with uh, uh i don't think he's doing any of the um any of the Vegas shows. Okay. It, um, uh, what's his name? Who was uh, from Rat Dog, um, the drummer? Um, uh, did a great job. Great. Yeah. So it was. Uh, it was amazing. Yeah. It was. It was okay. good to check that one off. I mean, honestly, I, I would have seen anybody. It wouldn't have mattered who was playing at the Sphere. I just needed to see the Sphere, and just having so that the Dead were playing. So that was what a treat. Yeah. So now you're uh, uh, you're joining up with uh, Jazz for Peace. Yeah, I'm, d I'm starting to do a little bit of work with Rick De La Rada, uh and and the group over there. Um, as a matter of fact, I was uh, before we we kicked this thing off. I was telling you about um, uh, a friend of mine who who runs an organization uh, called Alumni in Recovery, and basically it's uh, addiction awareness, uh, fentanyl awareness kind of a program, and it's it's very active in the north in the in north jersey and um we're talking to them about creating a fundraiser uh so that's going to be my first foray into uh getting this going with them and yeah. then here and then you're coming here to help me <laughs> <laughs> yes that's right we'll talk about that after yes yeah. yes Happy to yeah yeah uh, you know this is what we do when we get sober right i mean we we I, I feel like I've been given such a wonderful life that when I'm asked to do things for to make awareness or help another uh, sober friend or whatever, uh, that's my way of uh, giving back to what's been so freely given to me. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so we'll talk about it and see how I could be helpful. Glad yeah. to. So now yeah. you said you've been clean uh, eight years. Um, I'm assuming now you did a lot of dead shows earlier, right? Back in the eighties, nineties? No. Actually, oh, you didn't. I, okay. no, I didn't. I, I didn't. I. Uh, um, there's a, a when we talk about my uh, my book, there's um, a character in the book um, that after he uh, that might have been what you were thinking. Uh, after high school, he goes out and follows the dead around and tours with them for years and years oh. and years. He makes a living at the shows selling food and selling clothing and drugs and whatever else he could to make it to the next show 
and he did that for many, many years, all the way until Jerry died, and that's a part of the book. Um, but no, I got into uh, I got into playing the dead uh, with uh, various local uh, dead cover bands. Mm. I got really into it, um, and uh, you know, I I wasn't a major deadhead back in the day. Um, I I found them later in life, mm. and 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 uh, honestly, what really made me feel even more enamored with Grateful Dead was playing their music. Once I started playing their music, I was like, "This is just awesome." I mean, it really the 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 breathing room that you have as a musician to interpret songs, and they left the songs open like that. I mean, I I've listened to so many different recordings of, you know, whether it be Bertha or Viola. Viola Lee blues or Minglewood or whatever, and they're all different. They never, mm -hmm. it almost seems like they never play them the same, you know, and they never so did. They never did. Yeah. Some, I, I mean, I guess when they went through their, you know, cocaine phase, they were playing everything at double speed. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, I, I would start playing like, you know, Franklin's tower at like break, breakneck speed. And the band would be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I just listened to, you know, I was listening to, you know, 84 or 89 at giant stadium and they're flying through this tune, man. Like, I'm like, they're like, yeah, well, we're not doing that version. We're doing 72. I'm like, oh, okay. So that, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll slow down then. <laughs> that, and hey, you know what? And that was one of the greatest things about the shows was that, you know, I mean, with the uh, improvisational aspect of Jerry, I mean, Jerry would take them on a journey with the songs. And, yeah. you know, out of the 30 years that they played, they never played a song the same way twice. You know, and so yeah. like every show was like something. It was always new, even though they could play the same song. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true, and that, and that's cool. So, so my last, the last dead band. See, here, let me. There is a, there is a caveat to all this because the the true dead dead fans around here, and there is a community of of Grateful Dead. There's a Grateful Dead community here, and there's a ton of Grateful Dead cover bands in the North Jersey area. Rockland, North Jersey, that whole area. I mean, it's just a plethora of, of, of I'm going to say it, probably too many. But, uh, <laughs> but, but and, the, and, the dead, and the dead fans come out in droves still to this day. And I'm kind of known as the, I'm not really a, a dead drummer. Uh, I've been told that because if you ever listen to like Joe Russo's Almost Dead, um that's more my style of drumming i bring i bring a, a like a, so imagine imagine if um butch, butch trucks and jmo imagine them uh playing being the drummers for the dead right butch was a driving you know he was a driver he he drove the the beat he drove the groove right and and that's that's my style of drum so um Although I love to play and I can and I can interpret and I listen and I can go wherever I want, I'm more of a heavier hitter. So if you listen to Joe Russo's "Almost Dead," which I've been listening to a lot of lately, um, I just it's more like that's my uh, what I bring. So I was in this band called Seven Ten Experiment, and um, I was with them for for a couple of years, uh, and. Uh, Man, we would we did we went through this phase with Birdsong, where we did. I think the one recording we did at a gig was thirty five minutes. <laughs> it was a 30, 35 minute bird song, yeah. and then the next gig we did right after that was like thirty one minutes. And um, I mean, you want to talk about you know like weaving, weaving in and out of jams, and uh, then we would weave in a dead song in the middle of it, then come back out and go back into bird song. Um, there was times that we, and we've done that with, we did that with other songs and there were, there'd be times that we'd be like in the middle of jamming and we would, we would go into another song and I would forget what the song was that we initially started with. We were just <laughs> like, wait, yeah. where are we going? Yeah. Oh, that's right. We started off with that. Oh, you did yeah. just what you did just what Jerry does. 
Mm. Oh, and he played God. like like they turned uh like playing in the band was one of the songs you know that they i mean they would you know turn they played that for i think they did 30 37 minutes one time i think in a concert did they really yeah 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 i i think uh well, that band is the band seven ten experiment is not together anymore but we brought we bought the the guitar player and the and the bass player we brought a high energy level show like uh, i find a lot of the um dead folks around here are trying too hard to sound like the dead and uh we just kind of did our thing and we brought mm -hmm. an aggressive kind of an aggressive approach to to the music which mm -hmm. which people really liked mm -hmm. and we weren't afraid we weren't afraid to go off and yeah. uh you didn't stay there's no way to stay you know structured in a dead song you know because they no. didn't yeah <laughs> We just and we just sometimes would just see where it went you know and had such a great time yeah yeah kind of miss it yeah that was kind of you know what you were talking about with like led zeppelin right and and you know staying true to you know their music if you're playing their music what you guys are doing with the dead is staying true to their music you just go wherever it takes you yeah i mean that <laughs> yeah and you know what i gotta tell you something um uh, just kind of circling back to the sobriety part, like I'm, I'm playing in these these dead bands. There's a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, a lot of carrying on going on uh, with the people that were watching us and stuff. But when I was in a, when I was in a dead band back years ago, um, and I wasn't sober, you know, I used to think that I was playing better, and I would get into these jams. That, you know. It, you know, I'd get all high and I'd be drinking and stuff like that. And I'd be into these jams and I'd be thinking that I'm like, you know, I'm playing like, you know, at the, the height of my drumming. And then I'd listen back and I'd be like, oh, God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, am, what was that? And then and now like this, this whole um, uh, I say, all, all of my drumming and all the bands I'm in, I'm in a couple bands. And uh, I'm in a CCR cover band uh, called uh, The Fortunate Ones. We just had a gig on Friday, which was awesome. Just doing CCR uh, covers. It's just, just fun. And I'm in a, a band called Southern Stew. And, uh, and, but even when I was in the 710 Experiment, um, playing sober and really being aware of everything that's going on in, in the band uh, has made me uh, a far better drummer than I ever. I, I thought I had to have a few drinks, a couple shots, you know, smoke some weed, whatever, in order to be a better drummer to loosen up. And it's so not so not the case. I feel like my awareness is so much. It's so much tighter. I guess is the word I could say. I'm hearing notes. I'm picking up on where you know things that I never picked up on because I was too carrying on with what I was doing. Here's a little piece from Southern Stew playing Call Me the Breeze. You ready to get ready a little bit? Yes. I mean, that was the unfortunate thing too about Jerry, you know, was that some of his best playing in music was when he was clean, you know, when he was clean and sober, um, you know, back in the late eighties, um, you know, into the early nineties. I mean, when he was on top of his game, when he was clean and sober, you know, you listen yeah. to him when he was fucked up. I mean, he sounded like shit. He never really lost his ability to play the guitar. You know what I mean? He always had that, but he would sound like shit sometimes when he was singing. Well, yeah, well, it'll mess your voice up. It'll mm -hmm. mess your voice up depending on what kind of drug you're doing but yeah no i uh i i you know my i i there there were times when i played i, I was in a, a cover band um called midnight toast back in the day and i was in the height of my drinking and and uh and i remember there was one gig that we were doing and by the by the end of the second by the end of the second set i was just fucked up I mean, so they put me, they put me, um, next to, uh, set up next to a bar. So all I had to do was take my beer, put it up on the bar. And the, that was the key. That was the, so, and I was doing for every, for every, um, 
every beer I did, I was doing a shot of Jameson. And, and this started before we even started the show. So during the whole show, I was just pounding beer. You know, I pounded it down in between the uh, end songs. I, you know, bang. That was, his, that was his cue to give me another beer and another shot. And I did that for two sets. By the third set, we had to stop the show. I was so fucked up. <laughs> and, and I thought I was playing like, you know, Neil Peart. And like, you know, and I was a complete mess. Yeah. And now, now I feel like I'm playing my best drums ever uh, in m- now that I'm sober. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's just an awareness thing or being more connected, you know, and yeah. vulnerable, allowing myself to just lay back and hear what everyone else is doing, you know. So what was your uh, what was your uh, substance of abuse? Um, I'd have to say alcohol. Okay. Drug, drugs came came and went in my life. Um, they were always in and out. Uh, but alcohol was my that was my go to. That was my that was my baby. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> how long how long had you drank? I started drinking in eighth grade, and I stopped <laughs> when I was forty eight years old. And you got eight years now. And and I like what you had said in that email. I mean, the gifts that sobriety brings, right? What are they? What have they brought you? Oh my God! <laughs> uh, I have an amazing wife. Uh, I have an amazing day job um, that I'm very good at because I'm sober. Um, I'm 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 a creative person. I do I do uh, various forms of art, um, and it's just made me uh, a man that I've always thought I was and I always made you believe I was but I really wasn't I was a fucking fake man I was a phony yep. now I feel like I'm I'm at an authentic uh, part of my life and I mean you know we mentioned the book or whatever and all of these wonderful things and you'd be honest with you I wouldn't have any of them yeah. um, you know I listen I'm on my third marriage that should be an indication of you know how things were going for me <laughs> when I was carried yeah. off, you know uh, fortunately, my my beautiful wife April, she's um, she's sober as well, and and we just have you know I used to thrive on chaos, I used to thrive on the on the party, I used to thrive on on um, you know I wasn't the stay at home, sit in the basement, suck on a bottle of warm vodka guy, I was the have a few beers at the house, and it was like, where are we going? Yeah. Where let's go, let's bring the party. If there isn't one, I'll create one. And um, you know, listen, my, you know, I, I can't sit here and tell you that my my whole drinking career was just one big shit show because it wasn't. Um, there was some, there was a lot of fun in the way. You know, I have I, I have two daughters. Even though I've been married a few times, you know, I I I I always wanted to be um, uh, a good man. I always wanted to be an honest person. I always wanted to be authentic. I always wanted to be real. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how to be. I just mm-hmm. didn't. Um, you know, I I would be whatever I thought you wanted me to be. Mm-hmm. So if you saw me as a dead drummer, well, then I'll be a dead drummer. Mm-hmm. Right. If you saw me as a really serious guy or whatever or uh, this kind of business or the uh, uh, concert promoter well then i was going to be that concert promoter you know like it's still not really knowing i would be whatever i thought you wanted me to be not because i was too afraid to be who i truly was because i figured if, if you really knew who i was you'd fucking run for cover <laughs> <laughs> you know you'd be like ah this guy um so you know, through doing the steps and working with others and 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 walking the walk, you know, I, I fortunately I, I got a sponsor when I first got sober, um, about a month and a half in, and um, he's still with me today. And um, he, uh, you know, he guided me through the steps and uh, you know set me on my way. And um, and I watched what I watched with, you know, I listened with my eyes. I watched what all of these folks with 25 years, 30 years, what they were doing. They were, they were setting up rooms. They were still making coffee. They were, 
getting up and talking to the newcomer when they walked in the door. And these are the things that I picked up on. I'm like, why are these guys still doing this? I figured 30 years, you're exempt. You don't have to do this stuff anymore. That's what's keeping them sober still, right? So I, you know, I'm I'm a firm believer of walking the walk. You know, so many people talk to talk and it's like, yeah, you know, I do this. I, you know what? It's, it's when, you know, I always say it in, in my meetings. It's like, we're all we're all in our best behavior for an hour when we go to a meeting, right? We're all saying nice things and we're all doing all these wonderful things. And we're, you know, it's when we walk through the exit door and we go out for the other 23 hours of the day that all this shit matters. Mm-hmm. All the stuff that we talk about, if we go out and we start yelling at people in the car and we're not holding the door open for somebody when we're walking into a store, all the little all the little things that we think don't matter, you know, it's like, you know, what are we doing this for? So I'm a firm believer of walk and walk. And uh, I try to, I try to as best as I can today. And I think, I think it's about, you know, like, you know, again, like you were saying, like you find yourself, right. You find yourself, you learn to love yourself. I don't care what you think of me. Right. Because this is me. You know, it's the whole thing. Like love me or hate me. This is me. And, uh, and that's again, where we do find the power, you know, and you're right. I mean, you know, we find that, I have never, and I, I, you know, I have never seen anybody come into recovery that truly finds himself that you could ever say is a bad person. Mm. You know, it's all those illusions that they create that when they first come in, you're like, yeah, dude's a piece of shit, <laughs> you know, but when they truly find themselves, they're all good people. You know, Absolutely. I mean, these can be gang bangers. They can be, you know, <laughs> you know, some of those you know, tough prison, you know, people, but when they come in they truly find themselves and they love themselves, that's yeah. not who they are. No, we're, we're good people that are sick, you know, and, uh, you know, all the bad things that I did along the way. And, you know, as much as I, you know, like to say that I, I, I did some good things in my, in my life. There was a lot of bad shit that I did, uh, especially when I was younger, I got arrested a lot. And I and 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 I and I let that stuff define me. I let that stuff define me, not the good stuff, mm-hmm. right? I let the the bad stuff define me, and it made me feel uh, the best way I can describe it. And I know it's a little graphic, but I felt like a polished turd. Mm-hmm. Everything looked great on the outside, nice, uh, but there was nothing but shit inside me. Like that's how I felt. That's such shame shame and guilt and all the crap that we let uh define us and um you know i I gotta be honest man it took me uh you know yeah i'm sober eight years whatever but um i want to say in like the last year maybe two years i finally uh i'm liking myself <laughs> you know, and it's it's a journey, man. It takes a lot of it. it you know what? I, I you know, I, Eric, I feel like we could be on for for like five hours talking about this stuff. But <laughs> but but I so there was some big obstacles in my life. Um, res, big resentments, big um, things that I had to get past in order for me to cross over into a place that I could like myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, There was things um, I I had to forgive. I had to forgive some people that hurt me pretty bad um, when I was younger. Um, There was a lot of, a lot of things like that, like um, deep, deep stuff uh, that I had to let go of so that I could, you know, get to a point um, where like these resentments weren't um, uh, defining who I was. And the process of, of letting go and owning um, my, my character defects at the same time. And, and, and all of that stuff was finally got me to a point where I'm like, wow, you know, I can actually be in my company without having to be distracted. Like if I was alone, I had to put music on, I had to put the TV on, I had to do something if I was by myself. Cause I the thought of sitting in my own presence was, fucking painful yeah yeah (laughs) you know and now it's like i could come home have an empty house and i don't have to do that i could sit and quiet and be with me never i could never do that my whole life all i did was run 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 
So, yeah. Uh, so when you talk about the gifts, right, like um, going back to like my, my latest project, the, uh, the book that I, that I wrote, hmm. um, like all of these things, like, uh, you know, I'm able to be, a, uh, you know, uh, I'm able to be a good husband. I'm able to be uh, a good worker among workers. Um, if I hadn't done all the work that I've done, uh, the step work and some of the other stuff that I've had to do along the way, I wouldn't have had the, uh, the openness and the awareness and the clarity to even write a book. It would never happen. No way, no how. No way. Wouldn't have come off the way it did. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> and, um, you know, again, I, you know, that these, are, these are the gifts to me. I'm grateful every day for this stuff. I live in, in gratitude pretty much all the time because I don't know about you, Eric, but I should have been dead before I was 30. Mm -hmm. And I look at this like this is bonus material, man. This mm -hmm. is all like... You know, every little thing, good, bad, or indifferent. It is what it is. You know, I'm not supposed to be here to experience it. So fuck it. You know, I'm going to, you know, I, I take it as gratitude, uh, you know, even the bad shit. So tell me, uh, so tell me a little about your book. Sure. Yeah. So the book, um, it's um, right here. It's, it's called the Jersey death squad, a journey to kill Jesse Freeman. Now, you hear that title and you probably go, oh, my God, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't mind, uh, can I just read the synopsis real quick? Please. So people that are freaked out right now or, uh, you know, well, maybe <laughs> chill out a little. Um, so this is a story about four friends who grew up together in rural northern New Jersey. The four are close enough to be brothers, chosen family whose loyalty and love for one another becomes a powerful force in their lives growing up. But when the boys witness a tragic accident befall a local police officer, they are severely impacted, especially upon learning the full extent of the injury. As the boys witness the impact of the tragedy on their friend's wife and family, they, they decide to create a pact. If any one of the boys should ever become a mental or physical burden to their friends or family, the remaining friends need to end their life, right? Indignity not be, you know, beholden to uh, machines or whatever, right? Have some dignity. Decades later, once the boys grow, grew up to be men, they are devastated to learn that due to a horrible accident, uh, one of the, to one of them uh, meets the conditions they had described in the pact. The remaining friends connect with one another and set on a journey to get to their soul brother to fulfill the fateful, fateful obligation. A compelling, uh, frequently funny story about reconnection friendship and love that asked the question, can the boys fill the pact and murder the friend this many years later and with so much to lose? So, wow. um, yeah. So yeah, even though the, uh, the title is pretty aggressive, um, I think it needed to be because it needed to be an eye catcher. Um, but the story truly is about, is about love. So the, the pact itself is actually that, that kind of, um, stems from, uh, a true life story of some friends of mine when we were younger um, did create a pact just like that. Fortunately, we haven't had to fulfill the terms of that. <laughs> yeah, let's go kill him. Yet. Right? Not yet, yeah. <laughs> and if, <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah. So uh, uh, the rest of the book is, um, you know, it's been described as like kind of like the Sopranos meets uh, Stand By Me kind of thing because the characters from North Jersey. So there's, uh, you know, Scotty Carollo is the narrator of the book. He's one of the characters in the book and he kind of narrates the story. And, um, you know, he's like a real North Jersey guy, you know, forget about it kind of guy, you know, and, um, and then there's another character in there I was telling you about earlier. Um, there's four characters in the book. One of them befalls the accident, but, um, uh, this guy Gary uh, is the guy that that become that becomes the deadhead and follows the dead around. And there's another. There's a really cool anecdote. I don't want to give it away, but there's a really really um, later on. So in the in the character development, we talk about his experience, you know, with going out and traveling around with the dead and stuff like that, and making a living. And that was what he did for many many years until Jerry Garcia died in the '90s. So like that was you know mm -hmm. a long time that he was out out with them. But there is a really cool story that downstream um, while they're driving in the car because um, the one character that befalls the accident lives in Colorado. Everyone else lives in New Jersey. 
So the journey is them find, getting in a car and driving to, to Denver. And along the way, there is, uh, you know, some misadventures. There's a lot of anecdotes, uh, some really cool stories and flashbacks back to the, you know, 70s and 80s when they were growing up and how their bond uh, got created in the first place. So it's really, um, uh, I'm really, really happy with the way it came out. Um, uh, I, I, I've gotten some great response from it. So the book is uh, for sale on all of the Amazon platforms. Okay. So Kindle, it's in paperback, and it's on Audible. So Did, if did you do the Audible? I did not. No, no. I, got a, I hired a professional narrator. A uh, guy who brought Scotty Carollo to life like you wouldn't believe. Um, a real, I mean, he just nailed it. You know, think of like Joe Pesci or, you know, one of those guys in like uh, Goodfellas or something like that. And this is from the Audible sample that's found on Amazon for the Jersey Death Squad, A Journey to Kill Jesse Freeman, narrated by Anthony Ziello. I'm Scotty Carollo. No, I'm not Scottish. I don't even remember how I got that nickname. I'm Italian, to tell the truth. Rodolfo Malero Carollo. But don't tell anybody. Call me Scotty. I drive Argo, my Lincoln Navigator, to Gary's place. Gary Streeter lives in a funky part of town. Oakburg's version of the East Village, which sounds pretty pathetic. And it is. Most of the residents of his building are in their 60s and beyond. Gary, at 57, is considered a youngster. And even though he's the same age as me and Ian and Jessup, we all consider him the kid of our foursome. I pull up in front of a converted, subdivided brownstone and honk the horn. I'm not going in there, likely to get a contact high on a vast range of airborne material. I wait, annoyed at a habit. There's actually no hurry to get on the road. It's 27 hours driving time, New Jersey to Denver. My phone tells me. We should fly. That would be the smart thing. But flights are hard to come by. The winter holidays are over, but now it's ski season. Wrecked snow, and blizzards have canceled the number of flights on top of it all. So, I say sure, I'll drive. It'll give us a chance to reconnect, Gary pipes up, always a glass half full guy. Or I get on each other's nerves and kill each other, I counter in my head, or I get snowbound and have to eat each other's flesh to stay alive. Then there's money. Ian is rich as Croesus, ancient king, look him up. But I'm sure Gary doesn't have two nickels to rub together. I could offer to pay, or split it with Ian, but that would only embarrass everyone involved. But it's okay we drive the Navigator no matter what the operating costs, I complain to myself. It's not a serious gripe. I complain. That's all. Hey, definitely check out this book. You can go to his website, markmedingauthor.com. I'll also have the link that's posted on YouTube. It'll also be on my website at highwallclean.org. Um, just absolutely nailed the narration. Brought the whole thing to life. Just amazing. It was great. Um, yeah, so it's, it, was a, it was a fun journey. I'm already thinking about a second book at this point. Um, I've been asked if maybe, uh, you know, it, I kind of left it open for possibly a sequel. Um, mm -hmm. But I have, I have another book in mind that's a little bit deeper, unrelated to anything like this, um, that I might... Uh, I might take a stab at, uh, but right now I'm in full on, uh, I'm in full on promotion of this book. Uh, I just, I just found out uh, this morning that I, I reached uh, number 20 in the uh, pop culture category of Amazon. So I'm a, I'm a top 100 seller now. Um, there you go. That's, pretty, that's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, listen, it, it is, there could be seven books in that, in that ranking. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know what that actually means, but when you become a top, t a bestseller, in Amazon, it uh, it 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 moves your uh, it moves your mobility. It gives you mobility in Amazon. It uh, starts to give you more, uh, give people more awareness of of the of the book. So at 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 the end of the day, I want more people to to buy it. I'd love to put it into a movie. I've been asked, you know, would you consider doing a movie? I, I think it would be a great movie, to be honest with you. I don't know any, any other movies like that. Um, but, you know, one step at a time, you know, if it's in the cards, you know, all we can do is do the work and then uh, the rest is out of my hands, you know? 
Yeah, I guess the, uh, you know, I, I ended up writing a book myself. Um, it's called Pain, Failure, and Misery are the Stepping Stones to Success. And uh, it's <laughs> kind of, read that. yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> it's, part, it's part autobiography of my story. Um, yeah. And then it goes into, you know, recovery and it goes into different ideas of, you know, the stepping stones to success. And it's got, it's got, it's like true crime story because that was my story when I was back in my addiction. Um, and then it's got obviously like self-help type stuff and, you know, but, but I, I was really thinking about that with, you know, the ability to do that. You'd never be able, I, I don't know. I could never write a book if I was using number one. Um, I wouldn't even have the, the mental capabilities to do something like that. Um, you know, to be able to write a 300 and something eight page book <laughs> you know, yeah. It yeah. is crazy, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, it's true. Too much, I, w- I, w- I've, I had too much distraction in my life to be able to sit and do anything like that. Um, well, most distraction that I created myself really, but, um, yeah. So this is, again, this is, you know, the, the, the story, uh, interestingly enough, I mean, I've had the idea for this story. Uh, God, it's gotta be over 10 years. I just kept saying, I just kept thinking to myself, man, this would be such a cool story to tell. And you know what, what, one of the things that I, I really wanted to capture the time of growing up in the seventies and eighties, mm-hmm. uh, because I, I, I feel like it was such a, uh, such a precious time like yeah. when i think about and i compare it to today you know and the kids and what they're into today and everything is social media everything's you know buried in a phone uh, or some kind of uh you know distraction like that and and that's and that's just how it is and i'm sure if i grew up in in today's era that's what i'd be doing but i didn't i grew up in a day where there was none of that um there was no social media there was the no, social media was uh you know uh you know pulling up to a friend's house with a bunch of uh, bicycles in front of him going, Oh, that's where everybody is. And go knock on the door, you know, find out where, you know what I mean? Like you just rode around and you left the house in the morning and you just went and explored and you didn't come home and unless you were hungry or hurt. And parents and, could not get a hold of you. You know, that was yeah. the most beautiful thing. You're out there and, and you just, Oh, I'm, you're running late. And <laughs> it's like, now your parents can get a hold of you all the time, well, every second of every day. To find me out, right? If my parents knew, like sometimes I would like, I would set out in the morning and I would end up like in the next county. (laughs) Like, you know, that's just just what we did. We took, we took walks on railroad tracks and ended up in like five towns away. And, you know, like just the stuff that we used to get into. My parents knew half of the shit that we did. They would, they would have, it's good that they don't know. Let's put it that way. (laughs) Are they still alive? No, unfortunately, my parents, my parents both are gone. My mother passed away a long time ago, 1989. I lost oh. my mom and my father died. My father died sober um, with about, I think it was 34 years. Might have been 32. I can't remember, but it was 32, 34 years um, of sobriety Nice. Uh, back in 2014, 10 years ago. Okay. So your yeah. mom died. Your mom died young then. Yeah, I was like 21, 22 at the time. Yeah, yeah, we lost her quick. She went fast. It was uh, uh, she got diagnosed with cancer. It spread all over, whatever. And they were going in to uh, uh, do some surgery on her hip and remove some of the cancer that was in her bone. And then uh, they jumped right back in to uh, pull some uh, ribs out that had some cancer in it. And uh, my mother was short. <laughs> my mother was just like my mother was like five feet tall. And about five feet wide, <laughs> short little Italian lady, and uh, her body couldn't take it, and she had a massive stroke. And uh, four days later, we had to end up pulling the plug, and that was that. It was uh, it was kind of tragic, but um, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I was actually sober at that time. Uh, that was my first foray into sobriety. Uh, I was actually sober when she died. Uh, interestingly enough, I was in and out of the program when I was a kid. Um, because of a, a DWI I got um, when I was, uh, and I had to go get the card signed and that kind of stuff. So, but but fortunately, my mother saw me sober, um, and and my father and I started the journey together. And then after my mother passed away, uh, I decided I didn't want to. I just didn't want to deal with the program anymore. And I I set out on a what I like to call a, a 27 year slip. 
Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, I took on life. Uh, yeah, whatever. But, uh, yeah. So, but, but, uh, you know, I'm grateful that she got to see me sober and my father sober and that made her very happy. Um, so at least she died knowing that that was, uh, that we were both, uh, you know, trying to, trying to clean our acts up. So, yeah. But my father stayed in the program and he stayed sober. Uh, that whole time that I was out there running around, he uh, never busted my balls about it. Never, you know, like, hey, you know, you should come back to the meetings, you know, whatever. He just lived his life and, you know, and and I saw his life. And today I'm uh, incredibly grateful for it. I mean, I, my father retired up in um, like an hour and a half away in Lake Wallen Pawpack, Pennsylvania. And um, I used to go up there with my, my wife and even my, my kids, and the phone never stopped ringing. It would ring all day. People would just show up at his house, and these were all re people in recovery. His sponsees would start calling him at 7 o'clock in the morning. The phone would start ringing. People would be coming and going, bringing over coffee, bringing over some cake, hanging out. It was all part of the family. And um, it just always, you know, I... I never made fun of it or anything like that, you know, but I always kind of looked at it like, Jesus Christ, you know, can we get a, get any peace here? But I understood that that's what his life was. That was his community of people. That was his support group. And these people mm -hmm. became part of our family. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's beautiful. I mean, what a beautiful way to live. And um, I look back on that, you know, unfortunately he passed away. I was still drinking when he died. Um, but, you know, fortunately when I was ready, I knew where to go. You know, I knew I knew I could always come back. You know, I blew my life up the last time uh, eight years ago. Uh, it was, you know, and as soon as I made that decision to come back, I knew I was on. That was, uh, I was grateful that I made it back. <laughs> Did you go through a rehab or? No, I didn't go through a rehab. Nope, nope. I uh, cleaned up my act. Um, I stopped drinking for a little bit, and uh, just kind of toughed it out. And uh, and came back in and showed up to a meeting. And somebody welcomed me back in, and I've been on the journey ever since. Because we don't have to do this alone, right? Don't have to do it alone. And and I was and I'm grateful to this day that I was given the gift of desperation. And the and the and the desperation, just to be clear, for me, was to change. Because the same shit kept happening in my life. The same cycles of you know, of stuff kept happening. And I knew that if I didn't break the cycle somehow, some way that I was just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, right? I was going to be screwed. And so my, so putting the cork in the bottle, um, actually at that point in my life was relatively easy because I knew that in order for me to change, right, to really make the changes in my life that I wanted to, the first thing I had to do was remove alcohol from the equation altogether. Or there was absolutely no way that that was going to happen. So I put the cork in the bottle and I set on the path of uh, of, uh, of recovery and twelve steps and everything like that. I have a sponsor, and uh, and and I had to address some stuff outside of AA, some some uh, some trauma that that I that I you know that that happened in my life that I had to deal with, and. Um, and I did all of that, uh, much to my uh, sp my sponsor's chagrin, because I was in the middle of doing, you know, the steps, and I was taking on this massive trauma that I needed to take care of, because I knew it was a massive obstacle in my life. And if I didn't take care of the obstacle, it wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. No way I was going to be able to create. So I, I just basically told him, look, I'm doing this. So just support me. <laughs> I know you're trying to be helpful and you're my sponsor and everything, but if I, but I, I have to do this and I did, I'm grateful for it. And, uh, it's got me to where I am today and, uh, I'm filled with gratitude and, you know, I get to meet, you know, wonderful folks like yourself that are doing this, this these great things. And, um, I don't know where the journey's taken me, but I love the ride so far, man. It's been, yeah. it's been I keep on trucking. Pretty amazing. You know? And, and as the song says, it's been a long, strange trip, right? What a long, strange trip it's been. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> yeah, my man. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the book is uh, is a is a uh, product of my sobriety, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, if you're into it, it's a really funny story. Uh, it's a, it's a deep deep story, but there's a lot of love and and stuff in there. So check it out. And I'll have uh, I'll put all the links to uh, you know your your book and all that stuff on on the site. So people cool. can, people can just click. We live in that one click world, you know. That's right. Instant gratification. Bang. <laughs> I ordered something on Amazon the other day and it showed up in the same day. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. It was like four hours later, it was on my porch. I'm like, yeah. wow, that was amazing. Yep. <laughs> we are yeah. we are getting spoiled, man. We are getting spoiled. Well, it's like, well, yeah, you know, I mean, today we don't have to leave for the grocery store. I can just order it right on the Uber Eats or the whatever it is. They yeah. just deliver everything to your house. I know. It's uh it's amazing. Like all the all really? the all the meetings from work you do on Zoom. You don't even have to go to the office. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, that's uh half my life is uh doing exactly what we're doing right now, presentations and stuff. I'm in the technology field, so okay. I, I'm director of uh, sales for a technology firm and uh yeah grateful for for that i mean you know i'm you know even the creativity that i have in all my other areas of my life flows into my business life too i'm always thinking of ways to uh, be better at my job you know that kind of stuff so yeah yeah it was all about me it was all about what could i get from the job what can i how much could i make how, what can i do what can i do now i'm like what can i what can i give what can i give to my company right what can i give to the owners you know it's a that's exactly that's exactly where I, where I go, you know, is uh, I want to provide as much as I can. You know, I am right. in the substance abuse field, so I work with, you know, obviously, you know, I'm a counselor and, uh, you know, and that's really always my focus, you know. I want to make sure that I can give as much as I can, provide the greatest services that I can and uh, and do the best work, you know, for and, and we work for the clients. I mean, that's the way I see it. Yeah, my my sponsor is. Uh, we refer to him as Happy Day Fred because he is always says Happy Day, and uh, so we call him Happy Day Fred. And his mantra early on uh, in my sobriety, uh, when I started working with him, was, you know, how can I be helpful? Right? Mm -hmm. Enter into a situation with how can I be helpful? Not what can I take from it? What can I get out of this? Which is kind of like our whole life in addiction and and drug addiction and alcohol abuse, right? We're all about what can we get? What can we get? What can we get? And now, you know, it flips the, it flips the script when you start to say, what value can I bring to this situation? You know, whether you're going to a friend's house for dinner or a party, or if you're doing something for work or you're doing something in the program or whatever you're doing in your life and you, and you enter into it going, how can I be helpful here? Um, you know, like I go to parties sometimes and after a while of all the chit chat and whatever is over, I'm kind of done. So I, uh, you know, go in and I start, you know, cleaning the dishes, <laughs> you know, like, you know, let me clean the kitchen. How can I help you put stuff away? What can I do? You know, like it's just, it's just a, a mindful, beautiful way to live. Yeah. And um, only through the, the, the grace of sobriety in this, this uh, 12 step program have I found a life that I, I always wanted to live. And now I actually get a chance to do it. Well, I want to ask you a question. I always ask everybody this, but if you were to give a message to those that are suffering, people that are struggling, whether, you know, it could be suicide, it could be major depression, you know, or things in that nature, what advice would you give them? If a person was struggling with, with anything, if they're, if, if any of it is driven from guilt or shame from your past, just know that your past and, the things that you may have done that have gotten you to where you are today um, don't have to define you like we talked about earlier. Um, they don't. Um, I know we think they do. Uh, I lived in guilt and shame my whole life. And as soon as I broke free of that and uh, let go of resentments that I needed to let go of, I was able to um, start to become my, my authentic self and, and actually let go of the, the crap that I used to do. And um, so I would say, um, don't let your past define you. Find a way around it somehow, therapy, whatever you got to do. 
um, but get the junk out of you yeah. so that you can let the good stuff in. Yeah, because yeah, we're not our actions. I mean, we're the one that has done those things, but that doesn't define us. I mean, those are labels. You know, we put labels on ourselves. When we label ourselves, we limit ourselves. And my, you know, my favorite thing is that, you know, there's nothing I did that ever made me who I am. I worked on my self-esteem. I've learned to love myself. I have self-worth. You know, I have confidence in my life. Now, some of those things probably helped shape me a little bit, but I can say I love who I am today, you know, and that's where we transform that past. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I, I, I confidently say, again, you know, when I share in meetings and if I ever if I get the opportunity to, to share my story is that if I, it, you know, I wouldn't change a single thing that happened in my life, not not, a, a, you know, a single drop of alcohol, any drug I took, single act of debauchery, whatever, any crime that I committed, whatever. I wouldn't go back and change a single thing if it got me to where I am today. Yeah. But, you know, you got to do the work. You do. You know, and, 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 I, and the one other thing I will say to anybody that is struggling is that as much as you may think that you want to go outside yourself to this is going to make me feel good, that's going to make me feel good, that's going to make me feel good, whatever it is, you know, this is an inside job. And if you don't get in there, as painful as it may be, and dig through this shit, it's going to be a rough road. You're never going to find happiness in money, in relationship, in any of that stuff or things. Happiness comes from within. Yeah. If you have too much guilt and shame blocking you, right, you're never going to be able to let the good in. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. It's just there's no room. It's packed with shit. That's like I talk about, you know, my, my polished turd uh, analogy. That's what it was for me. I would let everything look good on the outside. You know, I was, you know, uh, you know, I was in good shape. I've always been in good shape. I've always taken care of myself. I've whatever, you know, things look good. Hair is fine, whatever. Da, 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 da. But I felt like the biggest piece of shit inside because of all that stuff. Right. And until I really started getting there and dig through that crap, I would have never found who I truly am and truly find uh, some form of peace. I never knew that peace was even possible in my life. Honestly, I really didn't. I want to really thank you for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. Back at you, Eric. I really, I, I absolutely, I could sit here for the next four or five hours chatting it up with you. Honestly, you're a great, you're a great host and, uh, and uh, you know, I feel a connection. So it's just wonderful. Thank you for, I mean, look, you know, I could, I, I yeah, I appreciate talking about the book and all that stuff, but I mean, the other the sobriety and all the other things are more important. Yeah. This is a product of my sobriety and it, you know, and, and that's, and I'm grateful for it. And, and, you know, if you, if you read the book, great, enjoy it. But hopefully my message of sobriety was more helpful. Yeah. All right. Well, Hey, again, I want to thank you. I really appreciate this. And um, as I always like to say to everybody, let's keep getting high. But let's do it clean. Let's do it differently. All right. I love that. Thanks, Thanks man.